It is an honor for me to be invited to be the keynote speaker at this annual general meeting of the Trinidad and Tobago Transparency Institution. This signifies to me a recognition by your institution of the importance and value and benefits of an independent office of the Auditor General. For this office, purpose is to provide assurances to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago about the appropriate usage of public funds and assets. Now, I also recognize that um, you know, the government of Trinidad and Tobago as a member of the UN has acknowledged and accepted the uh, sustainable development goals. And one of the key sustainable development goals which is relevant to this conversation today is sustainable development goal number 16.5 and number 16.6. And that really deals with corruption and the prevention therein of corruption. And just to continue on my own, so that you can know who we are, Based on our legislation, if you have an opportunity to look at it, um, our legislation speaks to the role and function of the Auditor General. And it is embedded in two main pieces of legislation, the Constitution by Section 1116 and the Exchequer and Audit Acts with reference to Sections 9, 2, and 11. However, when you look at that, you can see that the role of the Auditor General is that of an oversight function. It is positioned there because it's a traditional function. The legislation, it's particularly the Exchequer and Audit Act, is an act that stemmed from 1961, 1962. And therefore, in that era, the function of an Auditor General was really within the context of the framework of good governance. And so we are com can continue to be embedded within that framework of providing uh, a pillar of good governance. Now the topic today is the role of the Auditor General in combating corruption. In Trinidad and Tobago's environment, as articulated in the legislation, the Auditor General unfortunately does not have a specific mandate to actively address corruption. Rather, the legislative requirements which were written, as I indicated to you, were written quite some time ago. And therefore, it continues to place the Auditor General within the context of good governance through the promotion of transparency and accountability. Now, we tend to hear a lot about good governance. We hear it a lot about corruption. And it's all in, within the context of speeches, lovely speeches, conferences, academic papers. But what does corruption really mean to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago? Um, you know, when you look at the definition, the definition says, most often used by very simply, is the misuse or abuse of public office for private gain. And the current view of the man on the street as often reported in the local media, is that public officials are corrupt. And we tend to perceive that, that we are speaking only of public officials who are government ministers or executive, are part of the executive. But the misuse of power for pr private gain is not only at the macro level. In fact, it seems to be embedded in the very fabric of our daily business dealings. For example, how many of us sitting in this room, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, have not heard tales of public officers working in the public service demanding from citizens a fee to process an application, to grant a license, to approve an application, to clear custom goods, all of which are really forms of extortion. Extortion is a corrupt act. And corrupt behaviors such as these and others like this, like the acceptance of bribes and kickbacks, are often hard to prove since the evidence to support these activities are often not traceable. The staff of this Auditor General's department are also citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And we too read the newspapers, we watch the televisions, we are inundated with accusations about alleged acts of corrupt behavior. Citizens write to us 
um, pointing out alleged acts of wrongdoing by public officials, both at the macro and the micro level, and often suggest that the office undertake an investigation. For example, we have recently heard about forged birth certificates, alter alterations to land records. Um, these are things that we hear about and we know about. So whilst as an office for varying reasons, one of which limitation is our technical capacity and our human and final resource limitations, we endeavor to do as much as we can with regard to the request. We are not able at all times to actually pursue the requests. Um, so what we would often have to do is use that request as a trigger. And we use it as a potential red flag to identify issues of control risk for a particular entity. And we will then take that information and adjust our program of work so that our program of work will have included into that some level of uh, testation of the area that has been allocated to. However, you will know that I keep speaking about control risk and inherent potential for corrupt behavior to take place. Because unlike the Integrity Commission or the Police Complaints Authority, the Auditor General does not have an investigated authority embedded in its legislation. So, in keeping with our legislative mandate, our approach has been more of a watchdog. We scrutinize, um, we scrutinize, we assess, and we look at the resources, um, the misuse of resources that are potentially liable to happen. Um, we look to see also that within the framework of control that has been established by the Treasury, deviations from those control measures, because such deviations can actually lead to material breaches, which actually can be an indication of a corrupt behavior. Today, the Office of the Auditor General has established a working relationship with the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament. This is actually, um, within the last four to five years, this has been an improved relationship. Um, in the earlies, in the, around 2004, the Public Accounts Committee was not a very active body. And so therefore, many of the reports of the Auditor General forwarded to Parliament languished and did not have any significant impact. Um, but today, the this Public Accounts Committee, which is the body charged with, among other things, to consider and report to the House of Representatives on the report of the Auditor General on any such accounts, have in fact been having a lot of hearings in public, in camera, for which the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago have been able to acquiesce to and hear. Um, and, you know, Recently, most recently, um, the Public Accounts Committee has done something even further in that the recommendations that they have made over the years um, in one particular entity, um, last month we attended that hearing, and in, they went back over the last three years and they asked that entity to provide evidence of what they have done to address the issues that came out of the Auditor General's report and that came out of the hearings. Um, this to me is an excellent step because it is, it is showing that you are, you and I make reference to my fellow colleagues here, permanent secretaries, are being put under pressure by the Public Accounts Committee to ensure that the appropriate control mechanisms and measures are in place to protect the assets to which you have the fiduciary um, control over. Now, there have been times over the, where evidence found during the course of our audit examination have indicated the need for a more detailed investigation. And matters of that nature were often passed to the police to pursue. On a personal note, um, whilst I was out in the field when I was a field officer a few years back, um, we did encounter an issue um, that was apparently of fraudulent nature. We did in fact do further investigation on that matter before passing the matter on to the, uh, the relevant police authority. 
Um, the matter was eventually brought to, account, to court, and uh, my team and I had to face uh, the examination of defense lawyers. Um, we were not trained, and we did not know how to address the court. Um, what became evident in that cycle is that we needed to position ourselves to have our evidence in such a manner that it would be able to stand up in court. And we had to also been trained in how to be able to address the interrogation that defense lawyers tend to produce. So that was a handicap that we had that we've had to uh, improve upon. I would say that in that regard, we had um, developed a relationship with the Integrity Commission, and they were undergoing training with their staff, and so what they did was invited us to be part of that training. And that helped us in preparing our documentation to be in such a manner that even when we do hand it over to the police, it is in a manner in which they are able to run with and to be able to utilize. Now, we have reported over the years in, to Parliament areas of weaknesses observed at ministries and departments that could negatively impact on these entities' control environments. Such areas of weaknesses included inventory control, accounting for commitments, safeguarding of key documents relevant to supporting transaction, the management of projects, the management of procurement mechanisms, the maintenance of certain control revenue registers, such as remittance registers. All reports highlighted that such weaknesses, if left unchecked, could result in misuse of state resources. As most of you are aware of the acronym GONE, G for greed, O for opportunity, N for need, and E for expectation of being caught is low, therefore, our, the benefit of our report is to reduce the risk of there being um, the, an opportunity or the expectation that you will not be caught. Um, we, our presence adds to um, the control mechanisms of the various ministries, departments, and statutory boards that we audit. Um, just as an aside, you know, um, in going through this research here as to what we have done and where we've come and where we're going. Um, you know, I found a book that dates back to 1961. And the title of that was uh, a report of the Commission of Inquiry into Irregularities Disclosed in the Auditor General's Report for the Accounts of the Year 31st of December, 1961. And you know what was amazing? the irregularities continue to be the same in 2019. Inventory control, procurement, misplacement of documentation, which is a significant red flag that misappropriation of funds can take place. When documents start to be misled, you know that something is up. Contract management, lack of production of, of contracts and, and signing and authorization by the appropriate levels of persons. 1961, 2019, my report looked exactly the same. No difference, you know? So it, it, it is very daunting that we work in this field and we're trying to make such an impact, yet it continues to be a challenge. It continues to be a challenge. Recently, one of the tools we have sought to implement is to circularize ministries and departments to, to gain more detailed information about the ministry's control environments and their scope of activities. Responses from the ministries assist us to better understand their risk profile. Further, in 2015, we initiated a project whereby we circularized the ministries to assess whether or not they had policies and procedures in place to monitor, detect, manage, and report on potential conflict of interest situations. Unfortunately, only 50% of the ministries responded. Perhaps they did not realize, and I speak to my permanent secretaries here again, the importance of responding 
Because while we are seen as opposing, we are not. We are actually aiding and assisting ministries and departments to protect their assets. Uh, we are partnering with you. Um, the Office of the Auditor General also, in recent times, have um, expanded our work to beyond just looking at financial statements. Um, we have begun to do a lot more special investigations. Um, we do not have a clear mandate for that, so we use the Exchequer and Ordinance Act to say that we're looking for waste and extravagance. It provides us with that opportunity um, because waste and extravagance also is also pinned on many times corrupt acts and corrupt behavior. In addition to that, as we as a country move to becoming more technologically advanced and utilizing more and more tools um, of the electronic media, we have sought to upgrade our skills and capacity in that area. And in that regard, we have had a number of, we have paid for and trained a number of our officers in um, the audit of information controls. They have become certified. Um, in terms of that, we are actually partnering with a, one of our significant clients right now to review um, one of their systems in advance to assess the control mechanisms that they will be putting in place, which we hope will, we cannot eliminate, but at least it will help to mitigate against and militate against possible breaches. Limitations and the way forward, and I'm coming pretty much to the close. While Section 116.6 of the Constitution gives us um, discretion in the exercise of how we go about our business, in reality, the Auditor General's department is not functionally independent. And you may ask, why do I say that? Financially, our parliamentary allocations come, although direct our, our parliamentary allocations, they are under the control of the Ministry of Finance Budget Division. And therefore, like other permanent secretaries, we are subject to the control of releases of funds. And that could have a significant impact on what we want to do, where we want to do, and how we want to do it. It can limit us, for example, if we decided that we wanted to do an extensive um, review of our, um, our embassies, and our ambassadors, um, we may not be able to do that because adequate ALA funds were not released by the Ministry of Finance to facilitate such actions. Um, the Exchequer and Audit Act does establish a fee structure for entities other than ministries and departments. However, such fees are not to the generation of us, but rather they are to be deposited into the consolidated fund of the country. They are not retained by the Office of the Auditor General. Further, given the fees charged to statutory bodies are really at a minimum and limited basis, it really cannot even, even if we are allowed to retain it, support us in any way in the operational cost. Secondly, most of the funding that most of the fees charged out for our services are actually not paid. Um, because a number of these entities themselves are under um, financial limitations by the Ministry of Finance and do not have the adequate amount of funding to pay us. So it comes like it's a chicken and an egg scenario. In Trinidad and Tobago, Section 117 fine of the Constitution states that the Auditor General shall be provided with staff adequate for the efficient discharge of his functions. Note it says his, but it's a her. <laughs> However, by virtue of section 117.6, the staff of the Auditor General are civil servants, appointed by the Public Service Commission under section 121.8. And due to the veracity of demands placed on the Public Service Commission, the provision of staff as per the establishment has been somewhat challenging. It has been and continues to be the Auditor General's strategic objective to develop the human resource capacity 
Indeed, human resource development has always been our long-term investment. Moreover, obtaining additional skills, competencies, requires that we liaise with a number of governmental bodies, such as the chief personnel officer or officials of the public administration, most of whom are also challenged to match demand for their services with adequate number of staff to man the demand for their services. It is for this reason that the strengthening of the human resources has continued to be the center of our capacity building initiative. And by strengthening, I mean obtaining adequate, competent, trained staff in the, the ability to function in the complex world that we are now working with. It means that uh, most of my staff would be requiring retooling in order to raise the level of their competencies. The latter will enable the department to improve our analytical and diagnostic abilities within the complex environment, which we constantly find ourselves as auditors. Strengthening the Auditor General will not only promote better governance across all aspects of societies, it will also help combat corruption. One other limitation, and Mr. Abdul spoke to it, access to information is one of the keys in assisting in combating corruption. Now, Despite the provision in Section 10.1G of the Exchequer and Audit Act that states in the exercise of his duties under this Act, the Auditor General shall be entitled to require every person employed in his office who has to examine the accounts of departments to comply with any security requirements applicable thereto and to take any oath of secrecy required to be taken by persons employed in that department. However, the Board of Inland Revenue, by virtue of Section 4 of the Income Tax Act, Secrecy Act, continues to pose a challenge for us to audit the revenue of the Inland Revenue, which is significantly, significantly the main source of revenue of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. I don't know if you've been reading our reports, which are, can be found on our website, but you may have observed that we have continued in the last two years to put a limitation of scope paragraph as it relates to the Board of Inland Revenue in our report. Our current position is that we need to move beyond this. So in fact, we have sought to, through the Office of the Attorney General, to initiate an interpretation of summons. So we, pre we are prepared to go that to court to determine whether the Secrecy Act applies to us or not. Because as a country and for an entity that significantly collects the majority of revenue in this country, it is important that the Office of the Auditor General has access to documentation to determine whether all revenues are being brought to account. In closing, I would like to say that we continue to retool ourselves and bring ourselves up to speed. And because we are part of INTUSAI, which is the International Organization of Supreme Audit Institution, the subgroup being CARASI, the Caribbean Organization of Supreme Audit Institutions, we continue to align ourselves with the programs that are being undertaken by that entity. One such program is called SAI, Supreme Audit Institutions, Fighting Corruption Programs. And this is a three-tiered program which we have had representations on. Closer in this region, at present, we have obtained a representative from our organization um, to be trained in what is called uh, Intersint. Intersint is the use of a self-assessment integrity tool, and it's a training in this tool. This tool was developed by Intersize Capacity Building Committee 
and it is to be used to evaluate the integrity of and the risk and the maturity level and the integrity control systems within the public service. But to this end, what this program is doing is that it, we have to be assessed first. As an office, an office within the integrity framework, we need to see where we are positioned. So one of the first things that is being done, um, one of the first things is a twinning program is being initiated now that the officers have been trained in the use of the tools. And our representatives will be assessing um, the Office of the Auditor General in Dominica in terms of their integrity and where they stand. And we will also be assessed in February of this year to assess where we stand because as an office, we need to be upholders of integrity because we are also, we are saying that you need to be integrity, we need to come back, then we too need to have systems, policies and procedures in place that reflect that. So in closing, as the AJD, we are well aware of the negative effects that public corruption has on the economy. It undermines the legitimacy of governments. It weakens institutional capacity. Um, it diverts funds from the coffers of the treasury to other individual pockets. And it impacts, therefore, on the provision of services that the government can provide. I believe that we as an office, working with the other agencies, such as the procurement regulator, FIU, Integrity Commission, we need to come together. And, and we need to come together so that holistically, a combined approach can be done to combat the threats of corruption. I want to wish you all season's greetings, and I thank you very much for the opportunity for addressing you here today. Thank you.